All right, well, welcome to our Wednesday night, Doctor and the Chef. Um, many of you I actually know, but for those I don't, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, and I'll give you just a brief introduction of who I am. Um, my name is Antonella, and I'm a naturopathic doctor. Um, and I had a private practice in Sacramento, and that eventually became virtual. And now in the time of COVID, that's California and Oregon. Um, and I mostly work with women using root cause medicine um, and this idea that food is medicine and how and what we eat can really change our world and change our health. Um, and I brought the idea of the doctor and the chef to the co-op a while ago now thinking that we needed to bridge that like cooking skill and inspiration with nutritional knowledge. Um, and it actually lends itself so nicely to Zoom that you can cook in your kitchen and I can show you my kitchen. Um, and we can get that hands-on experience and you can review this afterwards or it's like a mini little PBS cooking show someone said in the comments uh, not too long ago. Um, so I really love questions. I think I haven't been this excited about beans. I was talking to a patient this morning and I was, she was like, good luck with your class. I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited for beans. Um, so please bring all of your questions. Um, we're going to cover digestion. We're going to cover why beans are so good for you. Most importantly, how to prepare them in a way that's easy and delicious and all the variations. This is not going to be that close to a recipe just because it's more techniques that I want you to get under your belt so that you can iterate and innovate in your own kitchen with the beans you like and the beans you have. But before we get started, because it is the time of the pandemic and we have all been cooped up in our houses, I want to do some quick introductions for all of us. And then I'm going to talk about the Mediterranean diet. We'll pull out legumes specifically, and then we'll get those slow cooked beans in the oven. And then we'll cook through the rest of the recipes. So my question for our introduction today is to say your name. Um, and if you were a potato, how you would like to be prepared? So I will start. I would like to be prepared as a potato as French fries, and I'd have those served with a glass of Prosecco. So Jennifer, if you'll kick us off, because you're next on my screen. I'm Jennifer Powers. I'm, I'm a client of Antonella. Just started working with her. It's been fun. Uh, and if I was a potato, I would be a baked potato with all the toppings. <laughs> nice. Jody, you're next. I'm oh, let me get you to unmute. There we go. Hello. There we go. Hi, Jody. I'm Jody. And um, I'm not baking or cooking tonight. My before and after plans changed, so I'm just <laughs> Yeah, Just, that's okay. That works. Anyway, it's lovely to see you again. I'm glad to be in, back in one of your classes. I would be a sweet potato and probably wedged or roasted with mm. spices and nummy things. Yum. Robin and Paul, I see you guys next. You guys have to unmute. Hi, this is Paul uh, and Robin. If I was a potato, I would be a fried potato on an early mo morning camping trip, up early and frying the potatoes and getting breakfast ready. Nice. And Robin? I would be a slow roasted uh, sweet potato with um, a variety of herbs on it and olive oil. Mm. Yeah. Roberta and Dennis, you're next. I would be a sweet potato wedge with honey and Aleppo pepper with a lemon yogurt sauce. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> the crowd that likes to eat. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> it does. It does. What it is. <laughs> yeah, nice. And I just be nice roasted potatoes. I always do a melange of uh, sweet and white potatoes and then roast with olive oil, rosemary, and sea salt and things like that so yeah Wonderful. there's no bad way to do a potato i think that's what we're learning here right <laughs> yeah <laughs> eric and crew you guys have three cooks in your kitchen so please introduce yourselves and which potato you'd be okay uh i'm eric uh 
I'll let these two introduce themselves. And my wife, Nancy, will be coming in momentarily. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, I guess I would be a red potato in a, a potato salad. So. Nice. Um, I'm Grace, and I would probably be a uh, boiled potato. I'm Thomas, and I would be a mashed potato with lots and lots of gravy on top. <laughs> nice. I love that. Well, welcome. Lisa, you're next. Hi, I'm Lisa, and I, I took a number of your classes in back in the day when you could actually go to the co-op. Mm -hmm. And I recently tried a new potato recipe. I think it's called a Hasselback potato. Oh, yeah. It's where mm -hmm. it's sliced. It was invented in a restaurant in Sweden and sliced up in, with olive oil and, and roasted and delicious. So that's what okay. I Okay. Would... Awesome. Tom and Susan, what type of potato preparation would you guys be? I think I'll be a nochi. Oh, nice. Yeah, we, okay, nice. And Tom? Got you. I want to be hash browns and eggs. <laughs> I like it. I think I, all of these potatoes have sounded good to me, so I don't know about you guys, but apparently I love a good potato. Lori, you're next. Oh. Um, not, look, not you, Lori. Oh. <laughs> yes, go and then we'll be other Lori. The other There's Lori. Lori, Lori Hickey. <laughs> Hello, yeah. I'm Lori, and I was thinking hash browns, and I also like roasted potatoes. That nice. Catherine. Hi. So I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Oh, if you were a potato, which, how would you like to be prepared? Raw, because <laughs> I don't want to be cooked. <laughs> um, <laughs> potato salad. Okay, potato salad. And Catherine Yakoi, you're next. There's two Catherines and two Lori's. Oh, 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 just a moment. I'm trying to, what did I do here? Um... I lost my video, I don't know what I did. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, so while I'm trying to get my video back here, I just I just registered half an hour ago, so I'm not prepared to cook along, but I'll still follow along. No, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's perfectly okay. So if I was a potato, I think I'd wanna be a sweet potato. I like it just simply with, um, uh, baked with butter and sea salt. Nice, okay. Wonderful. So we've got so many potato preparations. I love it. Um, okay, so just to orient ourselves to legumes, I want to give them a good introduction because that's what we're going to be talking and featuring today. Um, and so really legumes, in my opinion, are this like underappreciated sort of forgotten piece of the Mediterranean diet. So I really love the Mediterranean diet for f like so many reasons. One, though, is because of its effect on the brain. So we know that it's really healthy to keep a healthy brain long into aging, as well as when there's mood concerns like depression and anxiety. And one of the interesting studies that I wanted to like, liter like walk us through, because there's some interesting points in it and interesting points when it comes to legumes spe specifically, to like get us oriented to why they're such a big deal. So there was a study done in 2017 and they took two groups, one, and they supplemented them both with fish oil. So they were looking at the effects of fish oil and the Mediterranean diet. So they took these two groups. One group got this like crazy idea that they could use cooking classes on the Mediterranean diet, sort of like what you guys are doing right now. So that group was giving a cooking class and like a pantry box. So they got olive oil, they got some spices, they've got nuts. And so that's what that group did. The second group just had social meetings every couple weeks. So they would get together and chat and they took depression scores for both of those groups and then they followed them for three months. So at the three month mark, the group that was in the Mediterranean diet that they were getting those cooking classes, they had those pantry samples, they scored much lower in their depression scores. And they found like once they looked at all the data that people who had a higher Mediterranean diet score, so they were more engaged in cooking in that style, they had like, they had lower depression as well as stress and anxiety. And what was interesting in the study is that they followed them even longer. So they said, okay, that's the intervention we're going to do. We're going to go and look at them six months later, and those benefits still stood. 
And when they went back and said like, okay, what are the changes that these people made? There were actually significance in two food groups. So one was that they started to eat more nuts and seeds and olive oil. But the second significant change that they saw was the inclusion of legumes into the diet. So that segues perfectly for what we're going to talk about today is this food category of the Mediterranean diet. So we know that that style of eating is beneficial for the brain, but it's interesting that in their reporting, they're saying there's something like even more nuanced here that it's the inclusion of legumes that we're really starting to see some pattern that that's part of what's pushing these positive effects. So there's lots of reasons why legumes are great. Um, and I really like questions. So interrupt me if you guys have questions in any of this while we start to get cooking. Um, but legumes, they're generally, we understand them as beans. They include peas, soybeans would be in there with them as well. Um, but all, all the different beans, and we'll talk about all of those different things. But those beans are on the one hand, a really affordable source of protein. So they're a plant-based protein. And I think that there's reason to opt into them, not necessarily at the exclusion of animal protein, but they're a good affordable source of protein. They're also high in fiber, iron, zinc, and folate. And so if someone's anemic, for example, including beans with spinach and with some meat might be a really nice plan for them to replete those iron stores. But of those nutrients, folate is a really important one because it's literally the like B vitamin that we need in order to create insulation on our nerve cells. Also to make sure that we're producing our DNA, that like literal transcription of our genetic material, we need folate. And we also need folate for all our neurotransmitters. So like insulation in the nerve cells in the brain, our DNA and neurotransmitters are all related to folate. And legumes as a food group are a great source of folate. So they're literal brain food. The greens are also a really good source of folate. So you'll see in our recipe that we're cooking together, it's, fo it's folate in greens. Yes, it's full in greens, but it's really beans and greens together to be like really brain happy. Also things like zinc that modulate the immune system that are involved in a lot of different enzymatic processes in the body are high in legumes. So they're this just like wonderful, easy, I think basic building block and the ways to cook them is really varied. And that's what I want us to dive in more so today. So any questions on that sort of like initial brain nutrients? Mediterranean diet piece. Okay, awesome. So let's get into our beans. Um, so this technique is based on like an old Italian cooking technique when they had those communal bread ovens. And so people would bring their bread to those ovens, bake it off, take it home with them because they didn't have their personal ovens in their homes. But as those embers would cool, what people would do is that they would fill the wine bottles with beans, fill them with water, and put them in the ovens to cook really slowly as that oven cooled off. So this is mimicking that technique. We're not going to actually soak the beans, but I will speak to soaking once we get them in the oven. Um, but we're going to do a really low cook in the oven and this can be as simple as we're going to do it today. And then I also want to go through all the different variations we can do. So I'm going to move the camera so you guys can see what I'm doing over here. But you'll still be able to hear me. And you'll just see my pot. And then um, the beans. So the beans. We're using the Calypso beans from the co-op. This is a pound. Your recipe calls for half a pound. That half a pound is probably going to be about four to six servings. So this lends itself very easily to leftovers. So you could do the full pound. Um, if you did more, you'd probably want a bigger vessel. Really where you want to, um, the only place where this could go wrong is that you get the water too low. You just need to make sure that those beans are constantly covered by water. So the beans are just gonna go in the pot. We're gonna cover them with water, salt them. And do we need to rinse, Antonella, do we need to rinse them? You can, yeah. So you could give them a rinse and also pick okay. through them. I, to be honest, usually forget that step um, more out of laziness than anything, but like this one has like a few broken beans, a few beans that are maybe um, like a little brown, a little like 
funky looking, that's normal. So you can just pick through them and give them a rinse. Um, sometimes like beans will still have like rocks or dirt with them. So you just want to take a look and make sure that none of those things are there. Like I said, I usually find out when I, when I bite into them, um, when I bite into that rock when I'm eating them. Okay, so that's gonna go in there. And then I'm just gonna go to the sink and cover these with water. Um, but I've got a, a camera over there so I can show you what I'm doing. And I want it, the water to cover the beans probably by like an inch, inch and a half. And I'll just like stick my finger in um, so that I can see that there's enough water. But I'll come back and show you guys and I'll show you on the other camera as well. So if I put my finger in, I've got a pound and the water's to about my knuckle at this point. So you can see they're just covered pretty generously and then I'll put that one back. Okay, so we've got our beans, we've got our water and then I'm just gonna salt this pretty liberally. Um, probably a good three or four pinches of salt. And then I'm gonna do four tablespoons of olive oil. So you don't wanna skimp on the olive oil. Cause again, at, in this preparation, I wanna talk us through all the variations and where you can go with this. But in this most simple preparation, the olive oil is a seasoning. It's gonna give it creaminess, flavor, that unctuousness. It's gonna dress those beans. So you don't wanna skimp on it. So I'm gonna do a full four tablespoons, which is a fourth of a cup. And then this is just gonna go in the oven for anywhere between two and three hours. So I'm just gonna cover it. Do you ever use chicken broth or vegetable broth? Yes, yes. So let me put this in the oven and then we'll talk about chicken, vegetable broth, and then all the different variations that we can do with that. So that's just gonna go in the oven at 250. And I think on your prep list, it actually said to preheat the oven to 400 that's an error. You want to preheat it to 250. Um, and so, and then just put them in and set your timer. I would do 90 minutes and then you just want to peek at them, see how the water's doing, taste it for salt. If you need to add some salt, make sure that they're not too dry. If they have extra water, that will be bean broth. That's okay. And then recover them and then do another like hour to 90 minutes. You just want them to go till they're soft and each bean is gonna be very different. So this is just like hands off, but it's time is in your favor here. So I'm just gonna stick these guys in the oven. Can I ask a question? Please. So you said 250, it should be 250. Yes. Okay, so I love those, uh, those uh, cal calypso beans. Those are terrific. They're mm -hmm. so soft though, right? So is it amount is the temperature going to be different if you did like pinto beans which by the way this is not the bean we're going to use tonight though right tonight we're using canned beans yeah so what we're actually cooking is canned beans because i wanted you yeah. to do both yes. right like yeah. the name of the game is bean yeah so these aren't the beans that we're using in the recipe we're using canned beans yeah and sadly, um, we have pinto beans i thought i had cannellina i know they're not as soft but that's it that's what we're stuck with yeah and that will I'm work ask you what i'm stuck with um so I like to soak beans, right? And I know you're going to talk mm -hmm. about that, but it's and you'll talk about if it's different, this preparation that you just mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So to answer Tom and Susan, and this is going to get us like into the variations of the beans. So let me uh, share with you my like box of beans that I'm very proud of here. I can show, you, show it off to you guys. Um, this could also prove that I'm just crazy, um, but that's okay. Okay. So you can use vegetable broth, you could use chicken broth, you could use water. So that's just variations on the liquid. With the uh, chicken broth, if you like, you make your own chicken broth and it's really collagenous, like it's pretty gelatin-like. 
I would probably cut it with some water so that you're not getting like a goopy mess. Like you have some like liquid in there rather than just gelatin, but you could do it with a, like a store-bought chicken broth for this would be good because it's still pretty watery. It's not like congealed. Then you could start to think spices. You could add a bay leaf. Um, like just that would be not an upgrade. I'm, I'm telling you, these beans are simple, but they're really delicious. So you could add a bay leaf if you wanted a little bit more flavor. I, for example, if I do like these black beans here, like a black bean or there's a pinto bean in here too, um, I will add some cumin seeds, a bay leaf, some dried oregano, half an onion, and a couple garlic cloves and do the same exact technique and just put it in the oven. You could do um, like some thyme and sage, like uh, sprigs is the word I'm looking for, sprigs, that bay leaf, um, and half a lemon. If you've got little bits and bobs in your fridge. So really, I'm encouraging you to experiment with the flavors. Um, they lend themselves well to herbs, onions, aromatics, like celery, and um, carrots, but it's nothing that you really need to cook down or do much through. You just throw it all in the pot, you put the pot in the oven, and then just give it time to cook really slowly. Antonella, um, yes. on the pinto beans, I love the combination. Could I also just throw in a whole jalapeno? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do you, yeah, I, I, if I have chilies, my lips blow up. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. that's why that, that like gets left out. But yes, you could use red chili flakes. You could put a jalapeno in there. Um, any oh, yeah. spiciness would work. Okay. Robin, did you have a uh, question? Yes. Um, does it work well with like adding sauteed onions? You could, yeah. So if you had like a little bit more time and you wanted to saute onions first, like in some olive oil, even like a garlic clove, then add your beans, then the water, and then put it in the oven. That would work too. You could also quarter an onion or half an onion, just brown the sides, brown half a garlic, throw in the beans, put water in it, and put it in the oven. So it lends itself to all sorts of variations and experimentations. How about using a crock pot? Yes, you could use a crock pot. I will be honest, I don't have great experience with a crock pot in that I've never used one. So it's, I think it would lend itself to the same idea. Really what we're doing, and this will speak to the other Catherine's point, is that we're cooking it really slowly in a lot of water so that we don't need to soak the beans. So I think the same would hold true right with a crock pot. It's just a long, slow cook. Um, at a really stable low temperature without like a vigorous boil that you would do on the stovetop. And it also makes them creamy. They hold their shape. They don't fall apart as much. Um, so it's a really gentle cooking technique, but I would expect a crock pot to work. So um, I have a question about the soaking. So I understood yes. the soaking accomplished two things. You know, it softens them, it softens a bean. But also I understand that beans have, is it phytates? You know, that mm -hmm. beans have the antidigestive, and so I always dump out the soak water. Yeah. Right? I soak it. But it's yeah. Not so there's two strategies here, and there's, I think there's some folklore with beans, which is fine. I think folklore has existed for a long yeah. time. We should actually listen to it, you know, like beans and rice have happened because they work together well, right, in traditional cultures. So I'm not like this poo-pooing folklore. So yes, I think you're right that soaking achieves two things. One, I would more put it in that it's potentially can make the beans more digestible because it starts the digestive process by soaking them in beans in water and can make those easier to absorb. And it's going to take away some of those phytates. I sort of religiously would soak beans and then tried this no soak method. And I would say like in taste and how they sit on my own digestive system, I haven't seen a major difference. I feel like this long, slow cooking process makes up for some of that. Um, but that being said, there's also the piece that like dried beans are pretty shelf stable, but they can also get old. Right. So there are beans that even if you soak them and then you cook them for six hours, if they're old, they're never going to get soft. Like there's beans that you can just try to like cook the heck out of them and they're never going to get soft just because they're an old bean. 
So I would more think of soaking as a mechanism to help aid digestion and make things a little bit easier to digest because a good fresh being that shelf stable shouldn't need the soaking to cook better. It should cook well on its own, like on its own without too much preparation before. Another caveat in there is that like garbanzo beans, for example, if you want them for hummus, you actually want them to almost be falling apart. Like you want them really mushy. So then going through the extra step of soaking them, cooking them. And in that case, you can also add a little pinch of baking soda that's supposed to soften them even more. Mm -hmm. I think there's cooks out there who think that that's folklore and doesn't really work, but I add a little pinch of baking soda when I soak them and then I rinse that water, put them in fresh water, add another pinch of baking soda and cook garbanzos like a good hour and a half or two hours till they're really, really soft so that the hummus is really soft. So I do like soaking, but I would say experiment with this no soak method in the oven because I think it gives you comparable results. So you know what the If you don't have an ultras. I just, did a, me? I just did an America's Test Kitchen recipe for hummus mm -hmm. with garbanzos, mm -hmm. and they have you put in the baking soda, but then you, after you boil them for a bit, not a long time, you put, you rinse them with really cold water, you put really cold water, and then you, you just massage them a bit, and all the, 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 the skins float to the top, and you pull oh, out Oh, yeah, until you get rid of the skins, yeah, 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 yeah you can be, yeah. yeah. But it's a yeah, pain, it, right? But it's, it's a pain, pain, but you get that really hummus. smooth hummus, <laughs> totally. So really my encouragement to you is like for something like this is experiment with different beans. Like when Lori and I were talking about the shopping list, I was like, please get the cutest bean you see in bulk. Like experiment with something a little bit different, something that's maybe out of your comfort zone or a bean that you haven't cooked with before and try this technique on them and you'll sort of get to know them. It might lend itself to more like Mexican flavors or South American flavors or more Mediterranean flavors and you can really vary it. And just to show you, there's such a variety. Like there's these like yellow speckled ones. There's these cranberry beans. Mm. There's these green ones that would go in cassoulet or sort of French dishes. There's this like red pink one. These look like Halloween. <laughs> yeah, so like an ode to beans, just like I'd say heirloom beans, regular old pinto beans, you just want to try them and cook them in all different variations. So any other questions there or on like variations of the most basic recipe of like adding well, spices does that feel clear olive oil you you said to saute in olive oil but do you the kind of olive oil does it matter because of the heat point or do you so it wouldn't matter because of the heat point it's going to stay low at 250 which is totally tolerable for olive oil i would say that beans lend themselves to robust olive oil so mm -hmm. something that's peppery has a lot of flavor we've got like a could be bland and creamy and maybe like um like a blank canvas in a lot of ways would lend itself to something like a koroniki or a stronger more robust olive oil that has a lot of peppery bitter notes could go really well with a bean um, especially if you're using like tomatoes that would be a really nice combination um, but any decent olive oil is going to get you there um, so if you love olive oil like this one right here um you'd probably use a more robust one in this but i use my everyday cooking oil in them and they're good that way okay thank you good okay so for those who are following along ready to get to the cooktop because we don't really have a lot of chopping to do together um but i want to walk us through can the the canned bean which is just as good a bean as these fancy heirlooms um with the slow cook method and braising some greens um and then doing a fried egg on top which i think is a really nice template for a really simple nutritious dinner so you guys good on that one okay so i'm gonna go over to the other camera and laura you'll tell me if i need to switch anything yeah take my olive oil you'll be good with me okay I think we'll actually start on the greens first. Yeah. And then I'll get this guy going. And then we'll just talk through the prep here. Okay. So for the greens, I'm using kale. 
um, just some of this Italian dino kale that I just cleaned um, and took the ribs out and did like a really rough chop. But this works really well with any sort of green. So you could do Swiss chard, you could do mustard greens. There, excuse me, is there another camera over there? Yes, Lori. The camera isn't on. My camera isn't on? So. No. Nope. The one over there oh, in the work area is you're right, not on. You're right, right, right. Oh, now is it? Now is it? I huh. see you. Let me see. I had Lori, to. We're you double click on this particular view. She's she's in there a few times, so if you sort through the views. There's and I two just, cameras. Can you pin yeah, the double second one? So the camera I have, I have pinned on mine, which you guys will have to do it on yours, is I have the stove top pinned. Can you find that? She's got two cameras. Yeah, and I think if you go to the corner, to the three little dots, you can hit pin. And so you'll hear my voice, you won't see me, but you'll see my hands in the stovetop. Yeah, so once you find that camera, you pin it. Okay. Are you guys oriented or, or lost? Tom and Susan are good. They're good, okay, awesome, okay. I think Jen so we were talking still working on it. Do we need to wait for anybody or are you guys, all, is everybody, chime in if you need us to wait. Um, so I'm, I clicked on the camera view at the kit at the stove and I went mm -hmm. to the, up to the top right with the three little dots and yeah. there doesn't, it does, nothing says um, pin and there's not one in the actual picture for me. Should I just leave it maybe on gallery view? Yeah, maybe gallery view. I, yeah, I think sometimes Zoom is finicky on this, like participants can't pin or sometimes they can pin. Oh, uh, you know, I, I think because I'm the host, I can pin, but maybe the other folks right. can't. I can, I can pretty much see. Okay, okay. So we'll talk through greens. Um, so I'm using a kale, but you could use green kale, purple kale, Russian kale. Um, you could use um, mustard greens, collard greens, Swiss chard, spinach. This is just, again, um, it's like a nice technique that you can adjust to any quantity green that you might need to get rid of or use, um, or you want to just cook down and mix into other things. Um, it's, it's just a good technique. So I'm using kale because that's the green that I really like. Um, but I like braising these greens so that they like cook, get a little bit sweet. We have a little bit more flavor. They've got a little bit of sauce to them um, rather than just a saute. I like having them like covered in sweat actually a little bit. Um, so this is a medium heat. And I'm gonna do a generous drizzle of olive oil over the bottom of the pan here. So if you were measuring, that was probably like a good tablespoon, if not a little bit more. And then I just did the onion in little half moons. And I like to season as I go. So I do like a little pinch of salt each step just so that it's seasoned from the, like literally from the bottom up, but from that first base layer up so that it doesn't just taste salty at the end. If you want your onions to be, have a good coat of oil. If you see them here, they're shimmering. I'm probably gonna add another little bit of oil just cause I want them to be happy. Okay, so these guys are going to saute down. I'll probably be here a good five minutes or so. Yeah, question. A quick question. Even for this, you're using yeah. the olive oil, right, Antonella? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so while this goes, um, I'll come back over here. feel like I'm lost in between two cameras. So 
this question comes up a lot in terms of olive oil. Um, like, should you cook with it at high heat right. or like, should you expose it to heat at all? Right. Um, so I have a few answers to this. Part of it is actually informed by um, the chef over at Cobra Estates, who's a, a, a olive oil that the co-op carries um, in his presentation on olive oil. First, I will say that all of the research on the Mediterranean diet, most of that has been done in Greece. And there's been no differentiation in whether or not they're using, they're using olive oil across the board. They're using it in salads, they're using it to grill meats, they're using it to saute. The, it, culturally in the Mediterranean, olive oil is used to fry in, it's used across all cooking applications. So when we look at like the nutritional science of the Mediterranean diet, it's olive oil is used in all of those applications and no one's saying like, you know, the Mediterranean diet works if you use olive oil at this heat versus this heat. That's not how the, da the data is showing. So I think we have like the traditional use of olive oil and how it's used and it's used in different heat applications. Second, when we look at like food chemistry studies, yes, some of the olive oil, it's so highly concentrated with antioxidants that it almost self protects itself to damage. So you get loss of some of that benefit at those higher heats, but it's also protecting itself from oxidation and damage because of its inherent antioxidant properties. And if you look at like frying something in canola oil or corn oil or sunflower oil versus olive oil, you're maintaining a lot of the nutritional benefits still in the olive oil, even though you're frying. Um, so in my opinion, I think we should use olive oil raw in salads. We should saute in it and we should, if we're gonna fry, which shouldn't be as often as other cooking techniques, um, olive oil is a worthy choice across the board. So you'll see I saute, I saute, I bake, I fry, do everything in olive oil. Um, and I think the California Olive Oil Council that certifies extra virgin olive oil also echoes that, um, that we shouldn't really be you know, we shouldn't be trying to burn it, but that that isn't damaging necessarily to the oil and we're still gonna get health benefits if we're using it in a variety of different mm -hmm. applications. I actually do the same thing. I use olive oil um, for, uh, for high, high heat as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I use, it's the only oil I use. I don't use any other oil for cooking. Yeah, I'll use ghee for example, but that's oh, yeah. more for the flavor. Like if we're making mm -hmm. Indian food, I'll use ghee. Or like I sometimes like to do a ribeye and ghee, but I prefer olive oil sort of across the board. Sure. Um, yeah, so we're just going to saute those onions till they get a little bit of brown. I'm going to uh, meet you over at the other camera. Um, we just want them to get soft and just start to get some browning on them. And the other thing about legumes, sort of branching out from just um, thinking about the brain and mood, is that we also see that it has a really good effect on um, metabolic numbers. So let me go back. I feel like I'm giving my back to you guys, and it feels very awkward. Um, is that like? we look at the Mediterranean diet and metabolic disease, like abnormalities in blood sugar or total cholesterol that's too high or triglycerides that are too high or insulin resistance that someone's having a, a blood sugar challenge. What's interesting is that the Mediterranean diet isn't low carb. It has whole grains, it has legumes, but they see that people who follow it, even though they may not necessarily have weight loss at the end of it, they're having improvement of those parameters. So improvement of blood sugar, insulin, and cholesterol, which is really good changes in terms of heart health as well as brain health because having high blood sugar numbers can be a predictor for Alzheimer's or dementia later on in life. So the legumes as one of those like major food groups, even though they're starchy, they've got carbohydrates in them, because they're so nutrient dense and they've got that fiber and they're slow burning, they have a benefit in conditions that we might think like, oh, they need to avoid carbohydrates or not have any carbohydrates. That's sort of the magic of legumes. We just find that they're having like really good benefit on the gut, on blood sugar, as well as the brain. 
Okay, so how are your guys' onions looking? Mine need, I think, a minute or two. Jennifer. Hi. Okay, okay. First of all, you know, I'm kind of a new cook here. Um, yeah, and I always yeah. think everything has to be all perfect. So, yes. Can you this talk is like the anti perfect the recipe. Okay, but go ahead. Go with, with your question. <laughs> Just, that's good. You talked me off the ledge. Um, the other thing is, I got organic kale. Do we care? What are those little bugs that are living in there? I tried to wash them. Are they pure protein, Antonella? Are they part of the Mediterranean <laughs> diet? Yeah, that's another food category we're going to do next month called insects on your veggies. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. I think they're aphid. So kale, like, sort of is gives itself to like those aphid infestations uh -huh. i they sort of give me the heebie-jeebies like i grow kale in the garden and at the end of the season they're stuck but just a good rinse and like any extra will just be good good protein yeah. um yeah but sometimes they're like right on the stem but i think it's just aphids like really love yeah, kale. yeah how that you say that and i think i got most of them out but you know my mama raised me right she's like oh it's just extra protein yes so, <laughs> yeah i'm not too worried um, and then, um, the other thing was, um, oh, um, okay. I'm just going to say it beans and gas. Please. Like, yes. Is that, I mean, is that bad for us? Or I mean, like, how do we degas the beans if possible? Yeah. Or, or yeah. Or degas ourselves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Either yeah, one, yeah, yeah. one or yeah. the other. Um, yeah. So l let me take a look at the beans and then we'll answer that question or take a look at the onions and we'll go through that question because thank you for asking it. I think it, it needed to be asked. Um, yeah, so they're getting soft, but let's give them another minute or two. Um, I want to get a little bit of browning on them, so I'm going to turn them up. But this is pretty much, again, it's such a simple dish. We want to take some time getting these guys brown. Okay, so gas and beans. Um, so one of the strategies there is is the soaking that we talked about. So like the slow cook, either the slow cook method could really reduce some of that gas or soaking them and then doing that method or then, you know, using the soaked beans that can take some of that um, like aggravating factor from them. So that's one technique. The other one is that if you don't eat a lot of beans and suddenly you start eating them, they're going to start feeding that good gut bacteria, which we want. But as that good gut bacteria grows, it's literally going to off gas. Like its metabolism is to produce gas and that we experience as gas and bloating and discomfort. So a lot of times it's a matter of like starting low and slow, like doing a fourth of a cup as a serving and maybe in like three or four days later trying another serving and doing like twice a week and slowly building up so that you balance that like expansion of good gut bacteria in the gut without it being so uncomfortable of like bloating or gas or difficulty digesting. So sticking with it can actually be part of it and like consistency, like bringing it in, sticking with it, feeling like that's okay. And then maybe increasing to half a cup of a serving or with more frequency during the week. If you feel like, okay, beans are still giving me gas and they're still uncomfortable, then it might be a matter of combining them with like some digestive support, like a digestive bitter. Um, so let me actually show you a picture. They sell these guys at the co-op. Um, there's this company called Urban Moonshine and I have no affiliation with them, but you can find other brands. Gaia Herbs makes them, Herb Farm makes them, and they're uh, just called bitters. They're sort of like the idea of bitters that you would put in a cocktail, but these are more medicinal in that they have bitter herbs that have been extracted in alcohol, and you can do 10 or 15 drops to the tongue before, 10 or 15 minutes before a meal. And what that's gonna do is gonna start to prep your digestion get your liver going, get your enzymes going, get getting your bile and fat metabolism. And that can help just overall improve digestive fire so that beans are easier to digest. So that could be a strategy. You could also try like apple cider vinegar and a little bit of water 10 or 15 minutes before your meals to just help support that digestive process. If none of those things work and you feel like beans are still really challenging, it could be a sign that there's just an imbalance in that gut flora and that extra fiber in the beans is 
like overpopulating maybe an inopportune bacteria and you have a microbial imbalance in the gut. And then I would say that's, that would be like an instance where you want to work with a practitioner that can help clear that out using herbs and other strategies. And then you might be better able to tolerate beans, maybe not every day, but a couple few times a week. Um, but I think the bitters, soaking them, um, those are the first strategies and then going low and slow and slowly bringing them in and giving them some, some, some time. A lot of times people's digestion adjusts and then they're like, oh yeah, they don't give me gas anymore. There's just like a learning curve to that interior environment. Cool. But not Beano, not Beano. <laughs> yeah. So Beano, I, so I have people who have used it, who find it like it helps. Um, I'd have to double check. I think what's in it. I think it's a digestive enzyme. Um, and some people it works. I, I would have to look at it again, but I don't think it comes with like worrisome side effects necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. but I might try the, the bitters first. Thank you. I, I yeah. have a comment on kale and bugs. Okay. Yeah, please Lisa. While I get these, finish these off. I'm just going to add the garlic and then I, please go ahead. So about a year ago, I started washing all my lettuce and actually most of my vegetables and kale. Yeah, I have a big bowl and I put a splash of vinegar in the bowl and then fill it with water and wash the kale in that and then I rinse everything again. I was oh, nice. I was amazed that the bugs must not like the vinegar and I'm like astonished at the number of bugs that end up <laughs> in the bottom of my bowl. Hmm. So I yeah, nice. I and so before thinking. you did this technique, it sounds like you might have ate eaten sure. more bugs than you exactly. do. Exactly. <laughs> But now that I can, oh. now that I see them all, I, I do that. So I put, you know, I have a, get one of those big jugs of vinegar that you might use for like washing windows mm -hmm. or whatever, big white or plain distilled vinegar, whatever it is. Splash a little in the bowl, fill it with water, swish all the kale around and all the bugs just fall right off. And then yeah. I rinse the kale again and it's good. So. Nice. That's a great technique. Yeah. So if you like you know, if you're going to present something to company or you're not a big bug eater, that sounds like a great technique. Um, okay, so to the onions, I just added the clove of garlic, gave it a good stir. Um, and you can see there's like a little caramelization. Let me pick it out and show it on the camera. Here, like they're just starting to brown. Let me, I didn't get a pot holder. Yeah, so they're just like starting to caramelize that you can see and they're really translucent. And I added the clove of garlic, gave it a stir. So at this point, I'm gonna add a splash of red wine and just let it evaporate. I have an open bottle from lunch, um, but you don't need to use red wine here by any stretch of the imagination. But if you happen to have a bottle, you could use a little bit in here or if you have some in the fridge. Um, but I'm probably just going to use like a tablespoon or two and let it evaporate. And any red should work here. This is just red wine from Italy. I don't even know what kind it is. It's from the go-up. So there you have it. And then I like to just scrape everything if there's any of those like caramelized bits on the bottom, picking those guys up. Uh, and then, Anson, I can I ask a question? Yeah. So you added the garlic like after the onions were kind of... Yes. Yeah. So I'll just be transparent with you guys. I'm like very finicky about garlic. I'm not a huge fan of garlic. I don't like things that taste like really strongly of garlic. And I also hate the taste of burnt garlic. So I'm like very particular when I put it in a recipe. So if I'm going to chop it small, like I sauteed the onions, then I added the garlic, sauteed it enough to release some of that flavor, but so that it doesn't burn. Then you'll see for the other one that the garlic is cut in slices. So I have a little bit more time in the pan before it burns or caramelizes, and then we can move it with the beans. And then I could literally pick it out if I wanted to, which I have done before. So you're more just seeing like how finicky I can be with garlic. But if those things don't bother you, throw them in with the onions um, and just be careful with the heat because it can burn if it's really tiny because the onions just take longer to cook. 
Yeah. Okay. So the wine is going to evaporate off and then I'm going to add all the greens, then uh, add the chicken broth. Um, I just pulled some from the freezer, but store-bought chicken broth, vegetable broth, beef broth, any broth would really work here. It's like a fourth of a cup. You could even use water. Um, and then we're just going to cover them and let them wilt for about 20 minutes and cook down and give them a good sprinkle of salt. So let me show you guys that part. Yeah, so maybe just another 30 seconds for the wine to evaporate off. You could, if you don't use the wine or you don't want to use alcohol, you could also use a little bit of tomato paste here and, car and get that going with the onions. That would give you a little bit of acidity, which would be nice. Tom and Susan, do you have a question? Did you say cook the spinach for 20 minutes? Yeah, so we're going to cook this for 20 minutes. Um, oh. And this is more just a preference if you wanted to do less. But I like them, like, cooked down um no, like so that they're broken down and like super wilty and like almost like a green sauce like a green fibrous sauce I know that doesn't sound very good and Antonella because you're using yeah. the dino kale which is really really sturdy and she's using mm -hmm. spinach which is more delicate so it would be the same amount of time um probably not then I probably do 10 minutes check it at 10 minutes and then okay. You want to give it another five, but you'll probably be done in 10 minutes. Yeah, Lori, I think that you make a good point there. I just, again, I think you guys are just hearing all my preferences, and they're not written in stone, and please do what is your preference. But I, like, like the greens pretty well cooked, actually. Yeah, I think, I think. Part of the mushy, the better, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, and Tom and Susan, I think with the spinach, she's right. You're only going to need but probably 10 minutes at the most. This very technical technique of just smashing it all down in there. So we just put it in now into the yep. um, pot. Yep. Oh my God, just I, just into used, the pot. I just used ketchup without um, sugar for my tomato paste. I think oh. not a very good idea. Not, a, I'm thinking no. Why, what happened? <laughs> it smells like ketchup. Well, I, I think That's it right. could work. It's pretty much just concentrated tomato. So I think that right? means being, yeah, yes. I think that means being resourceful. I'll let, I'll let you guys know. You'll have to report it. back. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to get all of those guys in there. Give it another good pinch of salt, a little black pepper. I'm in Susan, question. How much, how much kale did you use? How many cups is that? Um, hmm, that's a good question. It's probably like 10 cups, I think. Okay. Yeah, it was like these kale bunches were actually pretty big. So, um, yeah, you know, like sometimes they're short and squat and the leaves aren't as big. These were pretty big uh, bunches. So at least 10, I would say, cups. So then I'm going to do probably about a fourth of a cup of broth. This is a little bit frozen, so... And then I'm going to put it down to low and just cover it and let this cook down. Okay. Probably in about like five or 10 minutes, I'll give it a check and a stir, just taste it for salt. Um, but any questions on the greens? Jennifer? You didn't stir the onions together with the greens, right? I didn't because it's all like stuffed in there. So okay. as soon as they've wilted, like I'll probably check on it while we're doing the bean puree. And as soon as it wilts, I'll be able to give it a little bit of a stir. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it depends how much room you have. I was getting a lot of kales overboard. Yeah. Did you say 10 cups of kale? Yeah, it was about 10, I think. Like loosely packed, like in a quart oh. Pyrex, it'd probably be about 10 cups. It was two two large bunches, Catherine. Okay. Yeah, it's going to cook down so much that you want to start with a big quantity or else you're just going to get like a little minuscule bit yeah. of greens. Okay. So you guys are good on your greens. Now we'll make our mash. Okay. Good. 
Okay. So this mash is super easy. Um, it's a way to like doctor up canned beans. Um, but we're going to use some butter. You could use ghee. You could use olive oil, right? I, I'm such an olive oil evangelist and I'm going off my own recommendations. And we're going to use butter because I think they go really well with the white beans. Um, but you could use ghee here. You could use olive oil. Um, so we're essentially going to just melt the butter. This pan has been preheating for a little bit, um, but you'd preheat yours on a medium, low medium heat. And then we're gonna add some sliced garlic that you can see on the second camera. And again, I like to do these pieces big because I don't want them to burn and I want them to spend a little time in that fat and really give off their flavor. And then we're gonna do some lemon zest with the garlic and the butter. Then we're gonna add the beans, smash everything, taste it, and then add a little lemon juice to count, uh, counteract that richness. So I'm gonna start with the melted butter. So this is like about a tablespoon and a half and your recipe is like one or two tablespoons work. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add the garlic, yes. Can I ask you about the difference between ghee and garlic? I mean, I'm sorry, and butter because I heard you say you used ghee for the steaks, but butter here, which I usually just use butter, but I don't know why, like why do people use ghee instead of butter? Yeah, totally. Yeah, let me get through sauteing this and then we'll talk through it um, because it's, um, it's different and it can actually be really helpful if someone's dairy intolerant. They can pro pro probably do ghee, but yep. not necessarily butter. Yeah, with it being clarified, it can cook at yeah. really high heat. It doesn't have the so, lactose in it. So here we're going to keep it like on a pretty low heat. You don't want your butter to burn, which will be a preview to why ghee could work here because the ghee is going to take longer to burn. Um, and you're just watching your garlic. Again, you don't want it to brown too much or burn. And then I'm going to use a zester, a microplane, to zest a uh, lemon, lemon rind into that just so that we get that like beautiful lemony flavor. Also, that color is really high in polyphenols and antioxidants and cancer-fighting things and the color of that rind. I think your recipe might say half a lemon. I'm going to do a little bit more than half here. Okay. So you should smell like that really beautiful garlicky, buttery, lemony flavor. And I'm probably just going to leave this approximately maybe like another minute, just make sure it doesn't get out of control. And then the white beans, um, I use cannellini beans, um, but I just rinse them in a couple flushes of water just to get that soaking and like canning liquid off of them. Um, but I really love white beans, like canned white beans. I find them easy to add to soups. You can make this uh, pureed. Um, I find them really versatile. They're really creamy. Um, so if you haven't tried just like plain old white beans, I think this is a wonderful way to go. And then this is going to make two servings. So now you can see the garlic's getting a little bit brown. So I'm going to go ahead and just add the beans and bring up the heat. And then to that, I'm gonna add a little bit of water. So we'll probably start with one or two tablespoons. Just add a little bit of water. And let it come up to a boil. You wanna make sure that all the beans are heated through and season them because they don't come with any salt from the can necessarily. I know these didn't. And then once they've been heated through, we're going to smash them. So I'm just going to use like what you'd use for mashed potatoes, um, like a potato smasher, and I'm just going to go in and start smashing. If you're making a really big quantity, like let's say you're serving a buffet and this is filled up more, you could use an immersion blender because you could actually be able to cover the bottom of the blender. Um, but for this 
the recipe as it's written, I find the potato smasher works better. And here you can mash as finely or as chunkily as you would like. So if you like it really smooth, you can get in there. But if you could have, you can have a few whole beans if you wanted a little bit more rustic looking. And I'm actually gonna turn off the heat because I don't want any of that really to boil off. Okay. And then at this point, we'll taste it. And so we're tasting salt, pepper. Again, these beans are pretty simple, so they can take a lot of pepper in my opinion. And then we're gonna do some lemon juice. So I'm going to start with about the juice of half a lemon. I might hold it back. These are pretty juicy, just to get an idea. So we're just using the lemon to give it a little bit of tang to sort of balance that richness of the beans. It's also a little bit of liquid to keep it a nice like pureed creamy texture. I probably started with about half a tablespoon. Not plenty for these. And then for me, I'm just gonna get another pinch of salt. Okay, so that's your puree. If you have to let it sit, you can add a little bit more water because it's gonna stiffen up as it sits. But if you were to serve right now, it's a good consistency in my opinion but I would add a little bit of water if I was gonna let this sit for longer or do it later, add a little bit of water, reheat it. So there's your puree. Any questions on that one? Okay, so let me stir the greens and then we'll talk about ghee versus butter. So for the greens, you can see they're getting wilty. And now, we can cover them. Now we can stir them with the onions. Tom and Susan, your spinach might be done if it's been 10 minutes, we might be close. I'm curious what decisions you're making over there on that side. I'm gonna give this a taste. This needs another little bit of salt. And then we'll give that a cover. Hi, Susan. We're doing good. We're eating. Yeah. Good. <laughs> I Tom like it. Tom moved ahead. <laughs> awesome. That's the best step. Okay. So I put a, a pan on for the fried egg or soft poached egg. Sorry, I'm eating kale. Um, okay. So ghee and butter. So butter has three components in it. It has um, the protein casein, it has fat, and it also has some like sugars, like some carbohydrates. So ghee is that you cook it on a really small, a really low heat so that you evaporate the water off of the butter and you separate the fat from the protein and the carbs on the bottom. So like uh, Lori said, it's the clarified butter. So you're just essentially like, using the heat to get all the fat up at the top and then that's what the ghee is and if you um go past like just that separation the the particles like that carby sugary part of the butter on the bottom can start to caramelize so you can get it to smell more like a hazelnut like that like sweet like really like brown butter mm -hmm. flavor and then that you can use for different applications. Like it would be good in muffins. It's really good in desserts because you have that like caramelized butter taste to it. But before you get to that point, if you just pull off that fat, that's clarified butter or ghee. 
And so it's just the fat from the butter. It's gonna have a much higher smoke point and it's not gonna burn as easily as if you had the proteins and the sugars mm -hmm. and the butter, which you do in like the normal butter that you would spread on toast, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why ghee is also good for people who might be uh, casein intolerant because you're mm -hmm. separating, it, separating it out. Um, so they might not tolerate dairy and the protein in dairy, but they're okay with ghee because the ghee is just the dairy fat. Mm -hmm. um, so like if I'm going to do a ribeye on a, on a higher heat, the butter just lends itself to not burning um, before you can actually sear the ribeye. That's why I'd opt for the ghee versus butter. Um, and sometimes I just like the ghee with the steak mm -hmm. versus the olive oil with the steak. Although you guys know I like olive oil on everything. Does that answer it, Catherine? I think you have another question. You're muted. Do you, so if you separate it out that way and you clarify it, do you actually use the, the bottom, bottom separated and then use the bottom for nothing? No, so at that point you would like let the bottom go till it's like nicely caramelized and it's essentially perfumed the clarified part and then you could use that clarified wow. part. But the bottom okay. you'll like get rid of, like you're going to strain yeah. that out and you want to avoid those pieces and then you would just get rid of it. I would, Catherine, I would, I would just recommend buying ghee. We, um, yeah. <laughs> we sell ghee at the co-op and, um, and it keeps forever. So um, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, because if you don't strain it all out, then you start to like, then it can go rancid and it's not going to be as shelf stable. But technically you can make it at home. I used to make it and then the fourth in heart is what they sell at the co-op and mm -hmm. they do an amazing job and that's all they do. So I go with the ghee. Um, so you guys saw the greens. I just gave them a stir with the onions. Probably going to cook another seven to ten minutes. Um, and then we'll finish it off with the eggs. But any questions on the bean puree or the greens? Yeah, your bean puree looks a lot more pureed than mine. Now, mine was pinto beans, but did you add more olive oil or more? I add, did you add the water to yours? Water, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I added a little bit of water and then a little bit of lemon juice. Oh, lemon um, juice. That sort of thins it out and makes it easier to smash it and get it pureed. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And then, yeah, I seasoned it pretty aggressively with salt and pepper. Jennifer. Oh, I'm just so, super excited. It's delicious. Oh, good. Is this the puree or the greens? The puree. Um, there yeah. are little kind of like hard, little bit of hard um, shells from the beans mm -hmm. a little mm -hmm. bit, but not bad. Yeah. Yeah. I think th this one is hard to get like a really, really fine puree. It's more like a rustic puree. Um, uh, I find that these pureed beans also go really well under fish. So sometimes that's like a blind spot in my radar of like, oh, things to serve with fish. But this cannellini bean puree would go well with a white fish. It would also go really well with salmon and greens. You could swap that out for the egg. Um, it goes nicely with fish, which for me is sometimes unexpected. Um, usually think of fish and potatoes. Yeah, that is an unexpected combination. I'm kind mm -hmm. of intrigued. Yeah, I also think salmon goes really well with lentils. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another mm -hmm. really nice combination. French lentils are so good mm -hmm. with salmon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So like the bean puree with uh, with a salmon fillet would go really nicely as well. Did you say so put, it, a, put a lid on the puree? Yeah, that's a good idea because then it will get a skin and can get dry. Yeah, if you don't put a lid on it. So for the salmon, are you, are you suggesting a uh, puree with lentils or just lentils? Just lentils. So you could do just lentils as like as simple as like boiling them and putting a little red wine vinegar and olive oil and serving them with the salmon fillet. You could technically mash them. You could make a puree with lentils. I think that would work as well. Um, you could do a mirepoix I, with the lentils, like the French mm -hmm. green lentils, little mirepoix, and then... Um, just, you know, season it well, and then, yeah, salmon. For those who don't speak mirepoix, that's just like onion, uh, carrot, and celery chopped, um, sort of like a base of French, of French cooking. Uh, you just saute in olive oil and then add those lentils. Thank you, Antonella. <laughs> no problem. Um, so any other questions on digesting beans, 
all those iterations of ways to prepare them. Brains. Chew 31 times. Chew 31 times. <laughs> yes. Digestion starts in the mouth. Digestion starts in the mouth. So you do want to chew your food. Want to try for 31 times. I dare you all to do that today when you eat your greens. You'll be there like a full minute chewing. But they yeah. last like 50 chews. Antonella has me on, um, I chew, every bite is 31 bites. It takes me like half an hour to eat. <laughs> right. Those are the insider secrets. Everyone's going to be like, oh my God, I can't see her. She's going to make me chew. <laughs> it's because I care about your digestion. I'm canceling my appointment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Digestion starts in the mouth. So that's like, we forget that, that we like start breaking things down and it's going to be much easier to digest it if we've chewed it and we have enzymes in our saliva that start breaking those things down. So that's the 31 times. And it's more like just so that you'll chew a couple more times rather than just swallowing it whole, which yeah, I sometimes yeah. do. By the way, yeah. this is not wine. I'm not on alcohol right now. So this is kombucha in a wine glass, just so you know. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> You're a strong um, woman, Jennifer. <laughs> oh, yeah, I am. I am very strong. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the egg preparation. Um, eggs are really interesting in terms of brain health. One, because I think they're such a, like, a nice form of protein. Um, most people tolerate them well, um, but they also have something in them called choline, which can be beneficial for anxiety. So if you feel like you've got a nervous system that is a little bit on edge, choline has been shown in studies to be beneficial and eggs are a really good food source of choline. Um, so there could be a reason to include them there. Um, but I find them that they're like an easy digestible protein. This meal could actually be done for breakfast, for example. If we, we usually think, I think, an American food culture of eggs for breakfast, um, but it lends itself for dinner or vice versa. Um, so I'm just going to do a fried egg. I would normally do it in the cast iron pan that I did the puree in, but in the effort of you guys not watching me clean dishes or a hot cast iron pan, we're just going to do it in a scan pan. But you could do um, a poached egg if you're comfortable poaching. You could do a poached egg. You could also do a soft boiled egg, um, which to get it soft boiled is really to your preference, right? Like I like to boil the water, put the egg in and then let it go about six or seven minutes. And then it has a soft yolk, but it's not like mucusy. Um, but really prepare the egg in any way you like. We're just gonna do it fried to go on top. Um, but any egg questions or any variations I'm not sure I could on the spot poach an egg. That might be a lot of pressure, but go ahead, Catherine. I, sorry, I have a question. I'm so sorry I asked me a question, but I just read something about poaching, which I've never tried to poach an egg, but this mm -hmm. recommendation was to put the egg into a, call, uh, a mesh, into a, a mm -hmm. screen on a screen on a, and to drain out the liquidy part and then to just retain the, you know, more solid part of the egg, which, you know, yeah. that there is that. It's awfully fussy, and I just don't know if that's because it says that you will get tendrils otherwise. This article said you would get little tendrils from the, um, you know, watery part. Yeah, so those are the ones that sort of like cook really quickly and like swirl around. If you really want to poach an egg, I would say the best bit is to spend some time on YouTube and watching. It's like there's a technique you want a little vinegar in the water and you want to swirl. So I usually go for the fried. I'm a sucker for a fried egg um, and oh, olive oil. Yes. I love the crispy edges um, mm -hmm. and then a runny yolk. So I'm just going to fry an egg in a scan pan um, for us uh, oh, for like dinner. That. Yeah, so let's do the eggs. Um, let me show you what I've got here. So just to make a plug that I think a lot of times when we think about food in the American food culture, it's like low carb, low fat, keto, vegan. But what we often miss about the conversation is that quality is really important mm -hmm. and that we're also eaters buying into a food system and that has its effects on the environment and climate change. And so I personally think of much more valid, not valid, that's not the word I wanted to choose maybe a constructive or sort of other way that we can enter into this conversation is really looking at quality of those food items. And I would say like a pastured egg 
is way different than maybe like a 99 cent egg that you would get at a commercial grocery store, that those aren't equivalent products. So when we talk about eggs in general, that quality can really differentiate them. So with eggs, I do like to opt for pasture raised so that those um, chickens had time to graze and be outside and be in their natural environment and eat worms and bugs. Maybe the bugs over all the lettuce Lisa has been cleaning. Um, and they are going to have that deeper red yolk. Um, and they're just that color and that taste that you see from a pastured raised egg just tells you that there's more nutrition in that yolk. And so those signs like color and flavor really translate for our purposes to increase nutrition. And pastured eggs is a place where you can really see that. You see the color of the yolk change and those eggs, uh, those chickens are actually outside rather than something maybe being labeled free range. And that just means that those chickens have access to the outdoors, but they're not actively living in their environment or in a natural grazing mm -hmm. pattern. So that's also where labeling can get really confusing. Um, so you want to opt for pastured eggs um, if uh, either from a local farm, farmer's market, or a place like the co-op. So that's what we're using tonight, our pastured eggs. And I'll have to say the flavor is extraordinarily different. Um, mm -hmm. You really can, t and I'm, I'm, I'm an egg, I'm a crazy egg lady and I'm really passionate <laughs> about my eggs like you are your olive oil. So yeah. I want the best I can get. Yeah, so really good eggs. So um, I'm just gonna do it fried in olive oil. And again, this is to your preference. I like it just flipped quickly so that it's not mucusy on top, but any way you like your fried egg will go beautifully on top of those greens. So let me actually grab a plate so we can see it all plated as well. Okay, so I'm going to give the greens a last taste. Could we do some of the pureed bean, for example? And then we do the greens. I left this guy in low. I'm just going to let it cool off a little bit. So you can see the greens are nice, like now really nice and wilted. And like they've got a little bit of a broth, like a sauce. It has a little bit of the wine in it. It's got the chicken broth. You can, the puree will absorb this. And you can give it one last taste for salt. Yeah, I think, I think that works nicely. So that's gonna go with the beans. And we'll do our egg. And in an effort to maybe not make a huge splatter all over, I might just cover this too with a lid. But I'm just gonna do olive oil. The egg right in there. See the beautiful color of that yolk? Yeah, so it's really deep yellow. It depends on the season too when they're like out in grass and there's truly more grass like right in the spring or the end of summer you'll get almost an orange yolk. Um, and to make things simple and so for when I flip this I don't break it which would probably be what would happen. I'm just going to cover it so that it'll cook over the top as well. Okay, so how, people who are cooking, how are your greens tasting and beans? Robin and Paul, it looks like you guys are eating now. They're delicious. Good, Absolutely okay. Absolutely delicious. Look, beautiful. I, I tried them and they were still a little, had too much of a bite, at least for my husband. So I'm cooking them more. I added some water and a little bit more wine and put the top on mm. them. Yeah. So, okay, good. And Tom and Susan? Ours was wonderful. Good, I added, okay. I added a little salt and pepper to the beans, but mm -hmm. very, very good. Thank you. Wonderful, yeah. And Dennis, how did your Moro beans? So Dennis is actually using some of the Rancho Gordo beans. Um, they use some Moro beans. So I'm curious how yours turned out. Uh, 
they turned out really good. Um, mm -hmm. we, we charged, so we were done with the greens uh, probably about 10 minutes earlier than the rest of you guys. But um, okay. everything came out good. We're eating. It's great. Good. Please enjoy. Bon appetit. Oh, Eric, I see your guys is over there. Oh, my gosh, that looks beautiful. What do you boys think? Or sorry, maybe not boys. I didn't see on the camera. I apologize. But what did you guys think? of the taste and Nancy. I'm, I'm still sniffing it, but Silas is going okay. to take the first bite. Nice. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to keep the, an eye on the egg here, and then if there's any last questions, and then I think we'll be set for tonight. What's your cook time? Hopefully you guys egg? made. Um, it's just... I think it actually might be done. So that was probably two minutes, I think. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I like mine actually a little bit runny. Yeah, I do too. Um, I love a runny yolk. Yeah, so then that will just go over the top and then I can show you guys. Can I see how you guys plated it? Yeah. That's gorgeous. Are you moving to the other camera now? Yeah. Okay, wait, let me uh, get over there. I have to find you. Okay, I'm almost oh, there. Oh, that looks delicious. Yeah, just greens and the puree and the egg. That's beautiful. Okay, okay nice. And then yeah. when, we, when we get the, um, the other beans um, done, then yes. you just use them for whatever, like in a, in a bowl. Yeah, so that's a great, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So the beans that are in the oven, we're at... I've got about half an hour left on them. So I assume if you're doing them that way, that's where you guys are in your timing. So make sure you check them for salt and water and then just cook them till they're creamy. And then you could use them, like you could serve a scoop with rice. You could puree them, mix them into other things. You can mix them into um, soups. You can also freeze them. So at this point, once they're cool, you can put them in Pyrex and cover them with the bean water, that bean broth. Um, and you can freeze them and then you can pull them in. Like if, if you did pinto, for example, you could make refried beans out of them, or you could eat that with some brown rice and avocado and like a cabbage cilantro slaw you can sort of go in different directions. Um, you could also just heat them up and wilt your greens in that broth and like serve it over squash or a whole grain that you like, and then put an egg on top. So you don't even necessarily have to saute the beans. You could just or saute the greens, you could um, wilt them in the bean water themselves as you heat it up. Um, yeah, so now you've got this like pot of beans that you can use in all these different applications or you can freeze them for other meals. Thank you. You're I have, welcome. I have a quick question. Please. Uh, a number of years back, I discovered that onions really upset my stomach, which is a shame mm -hmm. I love onions. Yeah. So what I do instead now is I, I replace the onions with fennel because fennel mm. actually looks like onions and yeah, has the texture of onions. So, you know, I like all of that, a very different flavor. But so whenever there's a recipe for onions, you know, I'll use fennel instead, or I use fennel mm -hmm. for a lot of things. Is there any other things besides onions that could be sort of used in a recipe like this? I mean, I assume fennel would work pretty well. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think fennel would work really well. Um, you could do actually, like if you do well with garlic, you could smash the garlic cloves so that they're whole, but they're just smashed and do a few more and warm them in the olive oil and then take them out if you wanted to. So you're like infusing the oil with more garlic flavor. There's also the Indian spice asafoetida um, that's like sort of pungent and oniony, but it gives you that savoriness that onion has that like you could do it with the fennel and add a pinch of the asafoetida that could give you some of that similar oniony. Do I don't know. It's A S A. I'll put it in the chat. If you're oh. visual like me, it's easier to see it. All right. And with that spice, you have to just be really careful. You only need like an eighth of a teaspoon at the most. Yeah, like a little goes a long way. Um, and then it can also leave your fingers like really stinky afterwards. So like measure it or use the end of a fork or something because you don't want that on your fingers forever and ever. <laughs> Lisa, I'm I'm uh, curious. Have you ever tried spring onions? Um, I did at a friend's house, and they actually were okay. Mm -hmm. 
but I just don't, I don't often have spring onions. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, just thinking. They yeah. were much better, but it was, it was strange. It took me a while to figure it out, but the onions gave me terrible stomach pain. Mm -hmm. And I've ate, I've eaten onions my whole life. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, but at least you found the fennel as a workaround because I could see onions are in so many things, right? That that can be challenging. And, and fennel is delicious. It is. It is. Another maybe underappreciated vegetable. Um, yeah. And do you guys feel good with the pot of beans? Because I know I was a little nervous. It's like an unstructured, like pantry technique. But a lot of times, like on a Friday, I'll sort of wake up and be like, oh, there's nothing for dinner. And we'll put on a pot of beans and then like use it in different ways moving forward. So I, I recognize that it's a little open-ended, but hopefully it does feel helpful to have that extra technique as yeah. in the kitchen. I have some heirloom beans that tomorrow I will be potting and cooking. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and experiment with different spices, do all sorts of different things. When, when you freeze the beans, do you put the li leave the liquid in? Yeah, it will depend. So I've probably done it both ways. Like if I'm going to make, uh, if it's garbanzos and I know I'm going to make hummus with those beans or more like a, like a bean salad, then I won't put the liquid. But like these ones, these calypso beans, I'd probably freeze them with the liquid because I might think like mm, that liquid would be good in a soup or if I want to puree it and I need some liquid um, or I want to like just boil some greens in there, just heat it all up and sort of have a lazy man's version of the dish. Um, so with those I would do, I would do the liquid. Um, yeah, so I think it just depends. I would probably do them with the liquid that way you have the option of getting rid of the liquid instead of the other way around. Yeah, but either should work. And I have the parsley, like parsley's good for, there's some health stuff in parsley, Yeah, right? so we forgot the parsley. Yeah, I went and grabbed it from the garden and put it on there. But yeah, there's this chopped parsley over the top, but it's really high in vitamin C. And those herbs are like a little like magic touch in terms of flavor, but they're also um, very intense in terms of nutrition. Like they're very few calories, but really high in antioxidants and nutrients and vitamin C. So, you know, the more you can put herbs on things, the better. Um, so yeah, the parsley plays that role. And yeah, if you guys had it and I forgot, put it on your beans, put it on the whole dish afterwards. And actually, still be good. if you're making a salad at home, we use Italian parsley in all of our salads. We take the, mm -hmm. pull the leaves off and that's always part of the, the salad. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, of course, the classic tabbouleh. Mm hmm Okay, well, yeah, so I think that by 30 mark. So if there's any more questions, otherwise, we'll, um, I will be uh, well, sending, um, I'll be sending everybody the video. Um, I put the um, lemon zest in beans, and it's really good. It's yeah, really nice. Yes. So, so eat that your butter beans. lemon, yum, yum, yum. Yeah, eat your beans and greens. 